Um, advertising. Advertising. Letter A. All advertising. That pretty much sums it up, right? And I get people all the time that raise their hand. They go, well, what about all advertising or business cards must can contain the name of the broker company? If the advertising carries your name, it also has to carry my name. You cannot make any advertising look as though you are the managing broker. If you have an email that says Sarah Realtor, you better damn well make sure it says Sarah Realtor, the Modulin Group, because if you advertise your name as an agent, you have to advertise the brokerage company you are associated with. That way, in case someone wants to complain, they have the access to get to the Modulin Group. Through your, oh yeah, she was with the Modulin Group, just call them, all right? That's what this rule's in place for, so that in case there's any ever any questions, they can at least call Sarah, and if Sarah didn't answer, oh, well, we can try the Modulin Group, all right? So all advertising, Letter C, any internet, television, radio that carries the name of the broker associated with the company must carry the name of the broker company as it appears. So you can't abbreviate or anything like that. However, there is one exception. And once again, technology has bit us in the butt. If there is not practical reasons due to the display, that would limit the information. And let me give you two good examples. Twitter and YouTube thumbnails. Those are both so small that by the time you put, especially Twitter, what is it, 160 characters? One of you young kids know this, 140, can't remember. By the time you put the Modulin group, that takes up you know, 15 of your letters. So if there is an electronic display that is limited in size, you do not have to put the company name, but you must put a link to the company name. All right, so in your Twitter, if you tweet something as an agent, you better have some way to link back to the Moslem group physically. All right, same thing with your web pages. You can have a web page called bestagentintheworld.com and sway your name all over the front. As long as it still says that you are an agent of the Modulin Group with a link to our page, you're cool, all right? And you see this all the time. You'll see so-and-so in the Remax balloon or logo and that's a hyperlink over to the Remax page. You can do that. Uh, shall not advertise indicating the property is offered by a private sale. It's called a blind ad. You can't just put for sale with a phone number. That looks like owner occupied. You cannot put for sale PO Box 121. That's a blind ad because you didn't give the address. All right. And you cannot put a sign on the property or in the yard of a property of an owner who has not literally signed a listing agreement. Right? Makes sense. I've done this. A couple years ago at Christmas time, you remember, you know, those reindeers that light up, you put in your front yard. I had a couple of those reindeers. And when I came home, John across the street, uh, let's, how we shall we say, had put my two reindeers in a very compromising position on the front yard, you know? And I, and he was laughing and I said, I'll get you. So the next day I put a for sale sign in his yard when he left and he called me, he's like, dude, what'd you do? I'm like, 
what? It's like, I've gotten three calls today. I'm like, oh, guess you shouldn't mess with someone else's front yard. <laughs> so you can't do that. And that was a joke that really happened. All right. Uh, splitting commissions, we are allowed to give a portion of our commission to induce the selling broker to bring a buyer to the property. That's the BAC we've talked about. If I pay a commission out, I have to pay a commission directly to the managing broker or their company and not the actual agent that's working for them. So when you go to closing, you will come back from closing with a check called the commission check, but that check will be made out to the Modulin Group, not you. And the other agent sitting on the other side will have a check made out to Remax Preferred, not Aaron, all right? And then you bring that check to me, I put it in my bank account, and then based on whatever split you and I have, I then write you a check from my bank account for your portion of my commission, all right? So the checks come in the name of the company or the individual broker if they don't have a company, but it's not made directly to you. Number 10, participation of brokers with security brokers. You are allowed to work with security brokers as long as you are not violating their securities law. One thing I wanna point out is the word right there, broker dealer on A, broker dealer. That is not us. That's what they call a securities dealer, a broker deal, broker dealer. So in that word right there, they don't mean us. When they say broker, don't confuse that. A, a securities exchange guy or what you would call a stockbroker, they are a broker dealer, just like we're a broker as well. Um, if you are unlicensed, if you associate with an unlicensed person, once again, the word is here is a bad word. What this means is you can certainly associate with them. You can't allow them to do licensed required activities. Number 12, if you are being investigated by the attorney general or the real estate commission, you in fact must comply and cooperate and submit all the documents that you are asked to give. If you fail to comply with an investigation, that in and of itself is also a violation. So theoretically, let's play a stupid example. If you were not guilty, but didn't give them the paperwork to show that, they could still get you for not complying with the investigation. When you sign up, you agree that you will, if investigated, actually help them paying you. You will submit all the documents and turn over whatever they ask, any lawful demand, you will in fact do that. Number 13, a stigmatized property is a certain property that has a notorious event that may give it some kind of reputation. There are a couple of them we talked about, the occupant currently afflicted with or died of HIV. HIV is considered psychologically affected property. If an individual died of any cause on the property, homicide, suicide, natural causes, if the property was the site of a felony, gang activity, a police action shooting, or the sale, manufacture, or distribution of a controlled substance. These are those that we have spoke about. They are called a stigmatized property. As the owner and the agent, you are not required to disclose to the, and they use the word transferee here because what transferee is, is both the buyer and the tenant. So they're getting two statements here with one. You are not required to disclose to a buyer. If you're renting property, you are not required to disclose to a renter either. 
So together they call those the transferee because those are the ones you're transferring the property to. It is not a mandatory disclosure. You cannot be held liable for the failure to disclose if it was affected or it was psychologically or if the details weren't re requested. Now, three, you cannot intentionally misrepresent a fact of a direct question. And we talked about this. The failure to say yes is not a violation. But if you lie and say no, it's not a psychologically affected property. That is a violation. If you say, we choose to not talk about this to topic, that is not a violation. You are not saying no, but you're not really saying yes. All right. Now, if it was the manufacturer of a methamphetamine house, that does not eliminate your seller, the, the responsibility of disclosing on the seller's disclosure that there could have been hazardous chemicals there. So he's not really saying it was a meth lab, but he could say, hey, there was propane and I don't know all the other stuff that would be involved. Are we hanging out so far, doing good? We're motoring right along. So let's talk about the listing agreement. The listing agreement shall state a definite expiration. Remember, we cannot have perpetual listings. Shall be in writing, either paper or electronic. One copy will go to the owner, and that owner must get a signed copy within three business days of his signing. Because typically what happens is this. You guys fill it out on zip forms, send it to them to get a signature. I've still got to sign it. All right. So now here lately what's going on, especially with agents that I get very comfortable with, they will fill it out. They'll send it to me first. I'll sign it. Then it'll go to the client for signature because mine's already on it. All right. And I know they like that three business day question. They get a copy. They must have a copy of the signed agreement. That means signed by me within three business days because I sign all of my listing agreements. Okay. 